The second session of the 2012 Ohio Beef School was held on February 9th and broadcast into 18 Ohio counties by the Ohio State University Extension Beef Team. Focus for the evening was targeting branded and value-added markets and the marketing alternatives they provide. The final speakers for the evening were Don Knorr of Pineland Farms Natural Beef and Logan Edenfield of Producers Livestock Cooperative. Their presentations begin now. Pleasure to have uh, two excellent speakers tonight uh, with you to share the rest of this program. First of all, we've got uh, Mr. Don Knorr, who's with Pineland Farms Natural Meats. Uh, he's in charge of cattle procurement and risk management as a specialist with that company. Don's also got uh, experience with other branded programs. As in, in uh, previous uh, job, he was also with Laura's Lean Beef. So we'll turn it over to, to uh, Don Moore and let him talk a little bit about the Pineland program. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I live, currently live in Lexington, Kentucky. I've been down there, as John said. Uh, I was with Lars Lean Beef for many, many years since, uh, I guess, 1994. But I want everyone to know that I am an Ohio native and an alumni of Ohio State, and uh, my blood still runs uh, scarlet and gray. So um, and it's good to be back to Ohio. And uh, I've been with Pineland Farms for two and a half years now. Um, Pineland Farms is uh, based out of the state of Maine, and um, the uh, it was kind of has an interesting story. Um, it was started in 2002 originally as Wolf Neck Farm, Wolf Neck Farm Natural Meats. Um, in 2005, it was the name was changed to Pineland Farms. Um, Pineland Farms is uh, supported by the Libra Foundation. This guy has an interesting story. The Libra Foundation was uh, created by um, uh, Elizabeth Noyes, who was. Uh, her family was some of the founders of the Intel Corporation with the Intel with all part of your computers. Um, she came back to Maine where her family vacationed quite frequently, created a foundation to support economic development in the state of Maine, and uh, a few years later she passed away. So she had this uh, foundation set up with multiple millions of dollars, and um, Pineland is, is part of that, and they do a lot of things from investing in and uh, you know banks and downtown buildings and one of the things that that they uh, invested in was Pineland Farm. Farms Pineland's is um, about 5,000 total acres. They have a, a herd of Holstein dairy cows. There's a, a cheese company there. Um, they uh, they own uh, Pineland naturally potatoes. Um, so many many things and and warm blood horses and the meat company is part of that. So uh, th that's basically the answer to the question that we always get is, why is there a meat company uh, based in Maine? But that's where it's at. Um, Pineland Farms, we have uh, two feedlots that the company owns, um, one in upstate Maine that has 2,500 head capacity. Um, we have our own trucks on the road hauling feeder cattle from Virginia up to Maine and then bringing those cat fed cattle back down to northern Pennsylvania to the uh, Cargill facility there. We also have a feedlot facility in central New York. Um, basically do the same thing. The capacity there is, is about 3,500. Um, we're not currently at that level there at that facility. But um, uh, And then we also have uh, regional beef programs that we, uh, that we supply product for. Um, basically, Pineland Farms from the natural meats is uh, a natural beef company, never ever program. And basically what that means is the cattle are raised without antibiotics, they're raised without growth hormones, and they're raised without any type of reprocessed animal byproducts. Um, those are the three requirements that's on our label and, and must be adhered to. Um, Pineland is unique. We uh, as we mentioned earlier, we have regional regional uh, marketing plans. Um, one is in the northeast part of the country. The cattle spend at least one year of their life in the uh, northeast region. Most of those calves come out of uh, Virginia. They're grazed in, in the northeast region um, and then fed there. And they were marketed as part of a regional program. 
We do the same thing in the Mid-Atlantic area. The Mid-Atlantic area would be would take in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and the state of Virginia. Ohio is part of the Mid-Atlantic region as well, um, but we do have a, an, an Ohio regional program here that's separate from the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, in these uh, regional programs that we have, we, our number one customer is Whole Foods. Um, Whole Foods is based out of Austin, Texas. Um, they have 300 plus retail grocery stores here in the United States. They attract um, a high-end consumer. Um, household incomes would, you know, would be in the upper upper part of the income level. Uh, pick a number of $150,000, $200,000 household incomes. Um, there's a large um, segment of a population out there that want to buy products that are naturally raised, organic products. Um, you know, we don't claim to be organic, but we are a naturally raised um, beef company. Um, the retailers, such as Whole Foods, and all retailers in general, want to separate themselves from one another. And as they package their various products, you, know, you take the cereal department, um, soups, whatever uh, items you want to talk about, you know, Honey Nut Cheerios is going to be similar at your Walmart compared to Kroger, compared to Whole Foods. But it's the fruits and vegetables in the meat department where these retailers can differentiate themselves from their competition. So, um, and, and they all have, uh, you know, uh, are very aggressive there to, to uh, make their, their, their departments unique and, and attract in um, a specialized consumer. And uh, Whole Foods is all about bringing in the high income consumer into their store. And um, these regional beef programs that we're part of with Whole Foods are unique because uh, it's very important to the consumer to have the animals raised uh, within a close proximity of where they're marketing the beef. You know, compared, you know, here in our part of the country, and I'm including Ohio and West Virginia and Kentucky and Virginia, Pennsylvania, um, the cattle here traditionally would be we uh, remove from the cow put on a truck and haul to Kansas and, and go into part of the network out there. Uh, you have high, high percentage of death loss. You have a lot of treats on those animals. Um, so our program is all about you know, keeping the cattle local, um, reducing the amount of hauling that's on the transportation that's on the cattle. Um, and, and it builds a, just builds a lot of confidence with the consumer to have cattle that are raised um, within a close proximity to the store. Um, Whole Foods is unique where the suppliers, like in Pennsylvania in the Mid-Atlantic region, um, whoever's cattle come are harvested that week, that person's name's put up on a chalkboard. The same thing's done here in Ohio um, that kind of connects the dots between the consumer and those of you who are cattle suppliers. Um, so Whole Foods is a big part of what we do. We also uh, sell to Hannaford retailer, or Hannaford stores. It's up in the, the Boston area and up in the Maine. Um, the prime cattle that we have off of our animals um, goes into the uh, food service area, and uh, and we do as much of that as possible. Um, I mentioned earlier that we process the. Uh, Cattle out of our northeast region and our mid-Atlantic region all go into the Cargill facility in Wyalusing, Pennsylvania. Um, we harvest 11 to 12 loads of fed cattle there on a weekly basis. Um, we also, um, as I mentioned, have the Ohio program here. Those cattle are processed in Milwaukee at the Cargill facility there. We also do four to six loads of additional cattle there in Milwaukee that goes into what we call our Pineland business. It's our own private label product. We have um, a lot of uh, cooked items, pre-cooked items, um, uh, shepherd's pie, barbecue beef, um, frozen ground beef, different items that we market under the Pineland label. And, um, and we require several loads of cattle for that product. And, uh, and, and those cattle are processed in Milwaukee. Um, 
Our, our program is all about USDA choice and prime. Our previous speaker talked about the, the CAB within the upper two-thirds of the choice grade. Um, our cattle simply need a great choice or better. Um, the selects and standards, any any practices that would be that would fall out, such as bloodshot ribeyes, dark cutters, uh, standard grade animals, um, older hard bones over 30 months of age, things of that nature. Um, those animals are called out from the program. The only cattle that we process or carcasses that we process in the Pineland program are the choice of the prime. Okay, John. Um, one thing I want to spend a little bit of time about time on, um, because we are uh, very closely aligned with Whole Foods, and is the uh, Whole Foods just recently come out? I guess not too recent, maybe what, two years ago, come out with a Global Animal Partnership. It's a program that was designed to. Um, enhance and promote good animal husbandry practices um, at the uh, cow-calf level, the backgrounding level, and the feedlot level, and um, simply put, this is simply to, to make sure that the cattle are comfortable while they're, uh, while they're here on this planet and, uh, and being raised and coming through the uh, system. Um, and uh, it's very important that the cattle are, are humanely raised, that they're being well taken care of, which if if we have producers out there that, that don't take very good care of their cattle, they're probably not in the business very long. And uh, so, but it's a way to document those things. And the uh, the, um, the Global Animal Partnership, which we commonly refer to as GAP, um, it promotes a lot of things. Number one is the most is good record keeping um, as far as um, calving dates from the calf, calf level. If you're a feedlot operator. And I realize that many of you here in the room, um, or maybe are both, have finish out your own calves. Um, record your, your calving dates. Um, record whenever you have to treat animals. Um, document whenever you run your cattle through and vaccinate. Document whenever you when you castrate your animals. Document when you wean. Just good record keeping all the way through the system um, is a big part of what the Global Animal Partnership is all about. Um, it encourages the good use, the uh, proper use of vaccines um, to vaccinate your calves. I don't want to, and many people will uh, have questions about can you vaccinate natural cattle? Yes, you can. Um, that's encouraged because uh, we try to do everything from a preventative standpoint to keep the animals from getting sick. Um, once the animals uh, have to be treated with antibiotics, they're no longer eligible to be marketed through any natural program. Including pine land, um, you can also um, work, you know, treat your animals for internal and external parasites. Um, so documenting those things is uh, is uh, is is very much encouraged. Um, one of the most challenging things <clears throat> of the program is the animals are required to spend at least two thirds of their life on pasture uh, or have continuous access to pasture. And that's uh, that can be challenging because uh, there's many calves here in the state of Ohio and, and surrounding areas that uh, surrounding states that uh, wean calves and put them on feed and confine those cattle to a feedlot when they when they weigh 600 pounds. Uh, that's not part of the program. Uh, they want the cattle to have out access to out, to outdoors. So, as a sense, we we really no longer put calf or feed. Or, put calves on feed, um, the cattle are, we're feeding a lot of cattle now that weigh 750 to 850 pounds when they enter the feedlot. Um, we try to incorporate as much grazing programs as we possibly can to let these cattle mature. Um, most of the time they're 14, 15, 16 months of age whenever they go on feed. Um, we can feed calves, but as long as they have access to um, outdoor pastures. Um, the, the GAP program promotes early castration. It's easier on the animals um, compared to uh, you know, castrating or neutering these animals whenever they're uh, at a later stage in their life. Um, the GAP program also uh, promotes and encourages a delayed weaning or even natural weaning. Uh, we like to see the calves 
um, stay on their mamas for at least seven, uh, eight months of, of age before the calves are weaned. Um, I know there's some people around that uh, are certainly interested in weaning their calves when they're four or five months of age, and uh, many people wean at six months, but we like to, uh, part of the program requirements is the animal stay on the cow for at least seven months. Um, it also promotes a clean, dry environment as far as the, the, the feedlot level. Um, at the feedlot feed, feeding phase, um, slatted floor barns are, are not allowed um, at this point in time. Uh, the, the cattle have to be fed on a dry packed barn. Uh, needs, uh, needs to be well bedded, and the cattle need to have sufficient room to, to get up and move around without disturbing the other animals. And, uh, and not be overcrowded. So, um, but this uh, Global Animal Partnership is just one more thing, you know, that Whole Foods is doing to further separate themselves from their competition. And uh, the customers that buy product at Whole Foods um, is concerned about how their animals are raised. Is there any way to document that? It's not anything that that we, uh, as a company, we, we didn't know what to think when we first come into play. But as we're into it now for at least two years, um, we're kind of getting accustomed to it. It's, uh, it's one way to document that, that the way we raise cattle and the way our suppliers raise cattle and our partners that we work with, you know, are raising cattle in a safe, and healthy, and humane manner. And it's, uh, it's really been uh, working out very well. And they, they have different, they have basically a five-step rating. We're only uh, trying to reach level one. Um, but you know we're part of the program, and it, uh, it you know, uh, I guess it uh, further enhances our brand. Um, the uh, feeder cattle. Um, and when we, we first got started with the with the uh, Global Animal Partnership program, um, and going through and certifying all the feedlots that we work with. Um, and that was uh, quite a challenge, but now we've been, for the last year and a half or so, been working with a lot of cow-calf producers um, in many states, primarily Virginia and Ohio and Kentucky, West Virginia. Um, and, and we as a company, um, if uh, any of you in the audience that would like to have uh, a supply of gap-rated feeder cattle, we could put you in touch with people who, who have been through the, uh, the gap program and, and have their certificate and looking to market their feeder calves. So, um, I'll talk a little bit about pricing. Um, our fed cattle that we buy in, in basically all regions, um, we buy all of our cattle on the rail. Um, we, uh, the, uh, we pay a premium over the five area average, which is the USDA quoted price in the major cattle producing areas in the western part of the country. Um, our standard premium is 18 cents on the uh, carcass weight. Um, we generally pay a two cent freight allowance uh, on top of that, so your final premium would be 20 cents a pound or $20 per hundred weight. Um, most of the carcasses that we uh, harvest or that we process are, are weighing between 800 and 850 pounds, and that 20 cents per pound premium would be paid upon that. Um, and again, it's only uh, uh, only for the uh, choice and the prime. Um, but one of the biggest the biggest benefits to our program um, is that we're not real picky on yield grade. As uh, Mr. Dykstra talked about, um, yield grade twos and threes and fours. And uh, I can tell you from my years of experience at Lars Lane Beef that there's about a hundred dollar bill difference between. A yield grade two and a yield grade three, a yield grade three and a yield grade four. So there's quite a bit of variation, and, and a lot of it comes down to how you actually fabricate the carcass and how much fat's left on the carcass, bone in and bone and bone uh, and bone trimmed off. Or, um, but there's uh, quite a bit of difference in uh, economic value just in yield grades, and uh, so. Oh, um, but we're not real picky on that um, because we want the animals to be high choice and prime, and it's difficult to to have high choice prime animals and still have yield grade twos and threes. So we're not going to penalize you um, 
per yield grade four, and that's a big advantage to what we're doing. Um, we don't have any discounts for carcass weights, um, and it kind of makes, we try to keep it as simple as we possibly can so there's no surprises whenever your cattle are harvested. Um, one thing, um, in a lot of uh, young companies such, pine, such as Pineland, um, in the or in the early years, and uh, most of the before I arrived, but uh, uh, there was a delay in payment. We, uh, you know, I don't know, about six, eight months ago, or maybe a year ago, um, that's all been changed to where uh, we do pay uh, pay on a timely basis, according to the guidelines set forth by Packers and Stockyards. I want to. Um, Kind of briefly go through some, for lack of a better term, Kentucky economics on a, on raising of natural cattle, and kind of where, you know, if you're sitting there wondering, should I raise my cattle in a natural environment or compared to raising them in a conventional environment? Um, the feeder calves, I think, if you're someone looking to sell your cattle or if you're looking to buy feeder calves, you you expect to pay at least a $25 per head premium. For the calves, um, depending and uh, maybe up to fifty dollars a head, and I think in today's environment it's probably closer to fifty. Um, the cost of the finishing of the calves, um, the yearlings once they're in the feedlot, is somewhere around ten percent higher than it is finishing conventional cattle. Um, I used in my example just a simple dollar per pound cost of gain for conventional cattle. So 10% over that would be a dime. So the cost of finishing natural cattle would be a dollar ten compared to a dollar. I think uh, Mr. Dykstra had it in at 108. The math is too complicated for me on that, but it's it's somewhere in there. It could be as little as five percent, depending upon your individual management style. It could be as high as 15. But you're you're certainly going to experience a higher cost of gain uh, finishing natural cattle. Um, the premium that we pay at Pineland, as I previously stated, is 20 cents a pound on your carcass weight. So 850 pound carcass, that's $170 a head. It's going to cost you $50 a head to, more to buy your feeder calf. Um, it's going to cost on 600 pounds of gain in the feedlot at a 10 cents per pound more. It's going to cost $60 per head to uh, extra to finish your animal. So the two to add it together is $110 a head, and our premium there coming in at $170. So you're still, you have a benefit there, if my numbers are accurate, of $60 a head. And, and it's, going to be, it's going to vary between your individual operation. Um, you know, it might cost you $140 a head more to feed natural calves time you, you calculate the higher cost of gain and, and a premium that you would pay for your feeder calves, uh, but it might only cost you $75 a head as well. So I think you could get into that. But those are the kind of just uh, big picture economics to kind of show you um, where we're at here. And, uh, and I think if you couple that with the fact that uh, there's no discounts on carcass weight, there's no discounts on yield grades, um, and all those premiums are applied to the USDA choice in prime animals, and it makes it an attractive program. Um, backgrounding options. Since the GAP program has come along, backgrounding calves uh, has become a big part of what we're really doing. Um, whether you uh, raise or purchase animals, uh, there's a benefit. We will, we will contract your your feeder cattle uh, when they weigh 750 to 800 pounds. Um, we do that based off the futures market, um, and depending upon the uh, particular month and, and where that would be. But I know um, August futures. Um, I know yesterday they were at a dollar sixty um, per pound or 160 dollars per hundred weight, and uh, so that would, you know, would basically represent a 750 pound, 725 to 750 pound steer. Um, 
usually the cattle here in the eastern part of the country is going to be trading behind those future prices. Um, and that difference between futures and cash would be considered a basis. Uh, we're going to get you up pretty close to the futures price uh, on your yearling steers. I know we've been contracting several 700 pound steers um, at three cents back of the board. So uh, that's, a, I think, a very attractive as you look at what your feeder calves are, are valued at. Um, there again, I think if you're buying those yearlings, you could expect, or buying or selling, you could expect a $50 per head premium for your steer. Um, the backgrounding phase, the calves must have access to pasture. Um, that's one of the main reasons that we're really attracted to these grazing programs and backgrounding programs is the cattle can have access out to, to pasture and, and fulfill the gap requirement. Um, cattle must be vaccinated with all the uh, respiratory disease, for respiratory diseases and treated for internal and external parasite control. Um, we have a certified pine land tag that we'd like to uh, have put in the animals. Um, we furnish that at no cost, so that's another, I guess, little perk of our uh, of our brand or being part of our program. Um, you know, from whatever a tag costs, I guess a couple dollars a head. We furnish that to you free. Um, as far as the, the finishing end of it, I guess this would be for most people north of Interstate 70 and a few here in the Hillsborough area. Um, we do offer some uh, forward pricing options um, where we would we would not pay you an 18 cent premium on your carcass weight. We would just simply um, forward price your cattle off of the futures market. And um, if uh, I think an example here, we looked at August live cattle at 128.50. Um, this was one day last week. I think I looked on my before I left home tonight. It was a I believe 129.50, but uh, you get the idea. You can take the 128.50 and simply add 10 cents a pound, so it take your price up to 138.50, and that gives you a live value. And then you simply uh, divide that by your dressing percentage. And in our example, we're going to use 62.5% dressing percentage. So that, I believe that that takes you up to um, 221.60 would be your contract price. And we would we would be willing to purchase calves based upon that simple little formula um, for your choice in your prime, and um, and then you and regardless of where the market would go, if it would go up ten cents or if it would go down ten cents a pound, you would you would be locked in for that. So uh, it's something that we've just started, um, and uh, we're kind of excited about it. Um, I know um, from past experience that it's. Uh, you know, we if the markets are up there really high, um, you know it's and, and and it's somewhat complicated to open up a hedge account if you're just feeding, you know, 40 or 50 cattle. And this something like this would uh, would work out very nicely for you to be able to uh, get a fixed price for your animals um, by uh, doing business with Pineland. That's basically uh, my presentation. Um, I live in Lexington, Kentucky. I cover Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Ohio. Um, we actually even go out into the Dakotas. I know we buy one of our uh, feedlots that we work with in Iowa is, is bringing calves in from Colorado, which is somewhat unique. You usually don't see the Colorado calves come that far east. But um, I, I do venture out that way from time to time. We have Scott Baker that, that lives over in Maryland, just uh, just north of the Virginia line. He spends a lot of time in Virginia and, and eastern Pennsylvania um, representing our, our company. So um, that's basically it. So if we have any questions, we can take those now. Okay, yeah, it's 4444. So, no, oh, you missed the number. Yes. <laughs> And just eight oh six forty four forty four. Very good. We do have a question out here. Okay, the question is, um, do we only contract for a semi load? And, and the answer would be no. Um, on feeder cattle, you'd have to be um, 
impatient or maybe help us find other cattle in the area. And one thing that I do want to mention is that we work here in Ohio um, very closely with United Producers. Um, Logan is the cattle representative and the next speaker here in the Hillsborough area. But um, we work with United Producers a lot, uh, pooling cattle together. Um, but we, we commonly put two groups of animals together or sometimes three groups of cattle on one semi-load, particularly whenever they're going to the, to the packing house. We try not to co-mingle many feeder cattle. Um, the part of the GAP program is the cattle are, cannot go through the auction barn. Um, and basically, uh, you as a, ca a calf operator would not have control of your calves then. And the person that's going to buy those cattle does not have control of the cattle. And uh, so that's just something as they were putting that together their guidelines that was not included. Um, but, uh, you know, we work with Logan and, and a lot of other uh, reps with United Producers and other marketing companies throughout the United States to to help locate and, and put calves together. Yes, uh, the, the question is, why is ionophores restricted? And um, ion the simple, I guess, answer is you, 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 once upon a time, and maybe still is, it was classified as an antibiotic. It has a, uh, and I can't take you a lot deeper than that personally, um, but I know they're referred to as an antibiotic ionophore. Um, I know in the early years of Lars Lane, we did allow that, and the USDA was, it's kind of in a gray area, but I think. Um, it's basically been um, determined by all uh, by USDA and all branded beef companies that are natural not to use ionophores. I wish we could because that uh, seems like that's the biggest uh, um, one of the biggest hurdles as far as natural cattle. Other questions? The question is under the uh, Global Animal Partnership, um, how are those? Uh, requirements of that program monitored and um, and who would do that and the answer is there, there's various companies I know IMI Global is one that would come out to your farm and do an on-farm inspection and they would go through the set of requirements with you and ask you questions you know um, when do you calve when do you castrate it's an honor system um, and they, they, they would come back and do that every 15 months. We work primarily with a company out of Virginia um, called Earth Claims. And, uh, you know, they have a six or seven page application that you would fill out, list those things down. They would actually send somebody to your farm and do an on-farm on inspection before you'd be certified. And, and they've helped. They've, they've, uh, they, they help clarify the process. Um, you know, there's... Uh, you know, people, uh, it can be somewhat confusing, you know, if you, you just market your cattle once a year, um, maybe you didn't get the message that CTC is an antibiotic, there's a lot of CTC in the mineral, um, you know, issues like that. Um, one thing that we find um, that uh, from time to time is uh, repros or, uh, animal fat in mineral and to uh, control dust. And that's something that's not permitted. So uh, I think it's good to um, have a, a third party, you know, just talk cattle with you and, and, uh, and kind of get somebody else's opinion on things. And I think it helps. The question is that on our premium with the 18 cent premium plus our freight allowance, if the animal's grade prime, is there a premium of the prime over compared to the choice? Currently there's not. Um, I think we'll, we will be working into that. Um, traditionally, our prime value of the 20 cent premium, you know, was more than the prime value itself. Um, and I know just recently here at the uh, Y Lucy plant, um, Cargill's price was, I believe, 12 cents over the five area average for prime. Um, you know, I heard the other day that there's some packers out there playing, yeah, paying on the upside of 30 cents for prime carcasses. So uh, I think that's something that we'll be looking at. And I'd also like to implement some type of a very basic yield grade formula that can 
rewards producers for the yield grade ones and twos without really punishing if you have very many yield grade fours. Because we run, I don't know, it's seasonal, but we run at least 15% yield grade fours just about on every level. And, and, and you're going to have that. You know, if you want the marbling, you're, you're, it's hard to make these cattle grade high choice and prime and uh, without having some yield grade fours. The yield grade fives you know, is, uh, we don't catch too many of those. But you know, if you have a yield grade five animal, that animal is basically um, devoid of muscle. You know, because the yield grade formula, as you evaluate muscle, ribeye area, compared to back fat based upon your carcass weight. So if you have a yield grade five, you have an animal with an extreme amount of back fat and a very small ribeye. And, and that most of those are coming in from uh, just animals that, that are very light muscle. Any other questions here in Hillsboro? Hey, Don? Yes, sir. No, uh, we've got a few here from various places. First, um, is urea allowed for non protein nitrogen? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, once in a feedlot, how much performance gain per day? might be sacrificed in your program? Well, I think that depends upon the, uh, you know, the performance in the feedlots going to depend upon the energy level of your ration. Um, in our feedlots in Maine, we get 2.9 per head per day gain on steers and 2.6 on our heifers. Um, you're going to have, uh, you know, you, you, it's hard, I, I can't answer that exactly how much, uh, you know, if you have cattle that have the capability of gaining four pounds a day, you know, they're not going to fall down to, to, to two pounds a day. But you're, you're going to experience, um, you know, a 10% to maybe even 15% higher cost in, in, in your cost of gain. I think, I think the individual performance will depend on the individual cattle and, the, uh, and in how you feed those cattle. Very good. That was a loaded question. Is there a cost with this on-farm inspection or to get certified? And if so, how much? The cost is, um, it started out $1,950. We've negotiated that down a little bit. That's per inspection. But uh, we've been picking that cost up in, in cooperation with Whole Foods. So there's the cattle for the pine land uh, and, and all of our programs there's, there's no cost to that. And I want to say, too, that we work, um, and I, I'm in Ohio and I didn't talk about it, but we, we, uh, we've had a relationship with um, Great Lakes Family Farms up in northwest Ohio for several years and uh, with folks there with the Ohio Signature Beef label. Um, that product is sold here in the uh, six, I believe there's six stores here in the state of Ohio that, that that's owned and operated by Whole Foods. Um, two in Cleveland, two in Columbus, and two in Cincinnati. There's also two stores in Louisville and one store in Lexington that all markets uh, Ohio Signature Beef as part of their natural program. And uh, that product is, is all raised and fed here in Ohio. The feeder cattle can be imported from Kentucky or, or West Virginia. Um, cattle have to be fed here in Ohio, and that brings us right back to the whole concept of, you know, um, hopefully they're raised here, they're fed here. Um, if we have a packing house uh, uh, in Ohio that could handle uh, of that scale, they would be harvested here as well, and then the, the animals are are uh, are all marketed here through Whole Foods, and we've that program's been going on for several years. Is there an annual inspection with the certification? Every 15 months. Every 15 months. And, and it's, we're just now starting the second round of the, of the inspection process. And it's really not that bad. I mean, it will basically inspection to be certified, you need to spend 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes filling out the application, um, get the application back into us at Pineland Farms. Sometime in the next 60 to 90 days, um, under normal timeline, um, you would be contacted by Earth Claims, and they would come out to your farm, 
depending upon the size of your operation, they would spend anywhere from, you know, an hour to four or five hours with you, um, you know, looking at your cattle and going through the process. And, um, and that, that's it. And um, it does have a little bit of a, a humane flavor to it, if you will. And I think, uh, um, I don't think that's all bad. You know, it, it, um, as we have uh, different groups out there that's, that gets excited about those issues, I think if you have a GAP certification, I think that helps, you know, um, make an argument that you're raising cattle in a humane way and with good animal husbandry practices. And by the way, I've also completed the Global Animal Partnership Program and, uh, and I passed and here's my certificate. And I think those types of things, you know, being a proactive standpoint goes a long way to, uh, to fight off some of those issues. Any other questions there? Actually, we have none here. So th thank you very much. All right, well, I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, spend some time and, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, folks, uh, we'll uh, get our uh, Last but certainly not least speaker tonight, uh, Mr. Logan Edenfield, who's a regional manager for United Producers, is going to kind of put a bow on this, talk about some of the things that uh, through UPI they've worked with some of these different programs and, and things producers need to consider before they jump into too deep in the, in the water, so to speak. And uh, again, uh, Logan's uh, longtime manager here at Hillsborough has also expanded his responsibilities with the company. Thank you, John. Just kind of go over a few things. Uh, for those of you that uh, are not familiar with our company, we are a uh, farmer-owned cooperative. I've uh, been in business since 1932. Um, do livestock marketing, uh, loan money also. Um, for the group here at Hillsborough, uh, John's going to hand out a few, uh, for lack of a better word, pamphlets of propaganda. Um, you can read at your leisure, uh, nothing you have to know about today. We operate in, um, have facilities in uh, six states. Uh, also have uh, two individuals in the state of Pennsylvania, as well as uh, some people that work in the western states. Uh, core, core operations are in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, uh, Illinois, Missouri, and Michigan, and Kentucky. Um, have seven auction facilities in Ohio, and then one collection barn in Stryker, Ohio. The company uh, in 2011 marketed uh, 3 million head of livestock, uh, about 100,000, or yeah, about 900,000. And, and so of those were cattle. Uh, through our auction facilities is also through uh, direct business, uh, like Mr. Knorr talked about, uh, you know, through his program, none of the cattle can go through our auction facilities on an auction day. Uh, we do utilize those facilities to uh, weigh the cattle. Uh, we can help determine the price of those cattle uh, through his program. Um, <clears throat> the uh, I'll go over a few things uh, about uh, what Paul talked about too uh, with CAB. Uh, we utilize. Um, the major packers in the area um, sell several cattle into CAB certified feed lots. Um, we, as a company, work with uh, other breed associations also, uh, the Hereford Association for one, certified Hereford beef. Um, there's not a packer close enough to us to market very many fed cattle into that program, but we market some feeder cattle that end up in that program. <clears throat> as a company, we have been designed through our membership to help facilitate some of what uh, uh, our members need, which is taking the smaller groups of cattle in our trade area and commingling them into uniform lots that would work into Pinelands program uh, or other programs. Um, we uh, have worked quite a bit with uh, Pineland Farms and the Ohio Signature Beef Program. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Don, but I think the Ohio Signature Program actually has three more cents premium right now to the farmers in Ohio. So instead of 20 cents, it would be 23 net to the farmer on the fed cattle. Um, but they also have the gap requirement, as all the other pint of cattle do. So that would be one added benefit of uh, putting your cattle into that program. Um, 
one thing Don didn't mention too is it's also not breed specific like CAB is. So it doesn't matter if they're Hereford cattle, Shorthorn cattle, Maine Andrew cattle, or Angus cattle. Um, that's one good aspect from our standpoint too. We're not limiting the amount of, or the type of cattle, breeds of cattle that can go involved in, become involved in. Um, from a logistics standpoint, I'll talk about the Ohio Signature Beef a little bit. Uh, United Producers uh, handles all the, the paperwork and the payment of the cattle, so it's consistent. Uh, you're not getting paid from different entities. Uh, we also, like Don said, follow the Packers and Stockyards requirements on payment, so it's a prompt pay situation. Um, we process all that paperwork, well, majority of that paper, well, all the paperwork for Ohio Signature Beef at Hillsborough. Um, regardless of where the cattle are loaded or shipped out of. <clears throat> um, some of the other Pineland cattle get done at some of our other locations, but um, we, we've had a really, really good working relationship with Pineland Farms and the Ohio Signature Beef Program. Um, just to hit a few other things uh, that we do and t touch on a few other natural programs that weren't discussed tonight. Uh, some of which are very small and some of which are, are sizable. Don mentioned Lorsling beef earlier. Uh, you know, if you've got cattle of breeds that maybe don't fit the, the perfect scenario for Pineland or for uh, other, like Ohio Signature beef or other programs or CAB for that matter, they have a natural program also. Um, we, can, we can source those cattle, whether it's limousine cattle or Piedmontese cattle or something such as that. They'll fit the Lorsling program a lot better. Uh, we source some feeder cattle for them as well as some mature bulls uh, for those for that company. Um, the uh, there's a couple other smaller entities here in Ohio. Uh, we deal with a little packer around Dayton, Ohio, and send them small natural cattle. You know, uh, a handful every a couple weeks. So that's another little niche market. Uh, we work with uh, Bowlands Packing in Ashland to have some Ohio sourced cattle there. Uh, some of which are all natural um, and that's been a pretty good relationship to to get some smaller groups of cattle in and get some really good carcass data back on those cattle too if that's of any interest to anybody um, we uh, we work with the only certified um, Angus feedlot in the state uh, it's down in Piketon Ohio um, we, we, we've been marketing his cattle for the last several years uh, getting some good carcass data back for him in that scenario. Uh, if you guys, anybody's interested in that, I can help facilitate, you know, helping you become certified Angus beef producers, um, get that certification process started, as well as, you know, uh, working through the Pineland deal. I've made a lot of farm visits and helped fill out applications for the GAP certification. Uh, all of our staff would be happy to do that, um, you know, depending on where you're located. Um, the uh, there's a couple other programs down the road that's going to possibly influence the market here in Ohio. Um, Meyer Natural Angus has got a Red Angus kind of oriented program. If you've got that situation, can't talk a whole lot about it tonight because they haven't got all the premiums nailed down exactly. Uh, but there are some other breed oriented uh, opportunities in that in that uh, realm also um, <clears throat> the uh, other things that we do uh, as a company we get involved a little bit in source and age verification uh, we can uh, we've got uh, one or two people in every state that can uh, help you work through the process with the USDA to get that done um, implement those programs uh, of which you know uh, several of the packers, which Paul talked about earlier, are given some premiums for that program on your commodity cattle. So, you know, just because you don't have natural cattle or don't want to go that way for various production reasons, you know, there's still some premium out there that you can add to your cattle. Um, most of all, I think all the all-natural programs are going to require us to more management, uh, like Don talked about earlier. Um, you know, that's vaccinations, that's weaning, that's early castrations, that's things that not everybody can handle with your facilities. But most of those are going to have those requirements. Um, 
in some form or fashion. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, maybe the all-natural program is not the, the most economical way to go based on your situation, but I think uh, it is a good opportunity to increase the value of your cattle. And what, whatever cattle you've got, you know, it's, it's my job working for the cooperative to market your cattle, whatever they are, whatever color they are, whatever size they are. And, uh, you know, that's part of what we do as a company is help coordinate some of those smaller groups and get them into the right program. Because most cattle will fit into some kind of program somewhere. Um, <clears throat> I would encourage everybody to get involved at the, as a certified beef producer here in the state of Ohio through the extension program in the Ohio Cattlemen's. Uh, if you're not a member of the Ohio Cattlemen's, I encourage you to join. And uh, I guess uh, if there's any questions, I've kind of rambled on, but uh, uh, please ask anything and I'll try to, to accommodate any questions. And if I don't have them, I'll get back to be with the answers. All nationwide, I'd say we're only, and Don, you might help me with this, in the natural programs nationwide, we're probably only, what, 5 or 6%? Small number. Uh, the Ohio Signature Beef Program in 2011 marketed, I think, around 1,200 head into that program. So, I mean, it's not huge numbers, but there's premiums out there for doing the work, if you can do it. And, you know, Paul touched on it a little bit. The premiums on CAB uh, can, can vary, you know, greatly. Uh, you know, sometimes the premium is two or three cents, and sometimes it's eight or ten cents on the carcass weight where the premiums on the natural programs are more consistent. What's the process of becoming a certified beef producer? Well, I think uh, the extension program has set up that up, uh, and I guess, Jeff, you probably would answer that question better than I would. I just, I know I went through the program, and John may take this one. Yeah, it's uh, the, what they're referring to as the Ohio Professional Beef Producer Program, and by attending these programs, you do get credit uh, towards that, it's 24 hours of educational credit. Once you're a producer, you're always a producer, but uh, we uh, have kind of evolved that over the years, and I think there's probably some other things coming in terms of quality assurance type certification too, but at least for the Ohio Professional Beef Producer Program, it's uh, 24 hours or more of uh, recognized educational programs to Ohio State. Any other questions? Yeah, Logan, uh, several of these programs are there any limitations on lot size or number of head that need to be used in marketing? The only reason there's any limitation is economics, just movement, being able to to uh, economically move the cattle from place to place. Like through Pineland, we've had, there's Ohio Signature Beef, we've had as few as five head of fat cattle from somebody on a load um, up to the full load loading at one location. Uh, feeder cattle wise, it's just like Don said earlier, you know, just finding the right spot for that set of number of calves. I mean, we've moved groups, whether it's for Pineland or Lower's Lean, groups as few as five or six into the programs, um, or groups as many as two or three hundred into the program. So, you know, size makes it easier, but it's not a requirement. Producers gather commingled lots of CAB eligible cattle? Uh, we can. Um, you know, if, if the, the producers have, we, we've got a few feed yards in the West we deal with that, that request source, source and age verified cattle with Angus source tags in them. Uh, those would be of more value most of the time, uh, or all the time they're of more value because of the source and age verification um, and the Angus source tags. We, we do that uh, when we can. And, uh, Anytime you can get more volume together, that that will make the cattle more cattle more valuable. Are there any opportunities for video marketing? Uh, yes, I mean that's obvious with what Superior Livestock does on the TV. There's obviously uh, marketing opportunities there. We have done in the past um, uh, board sales um, with limited success, just because of the volume. Uh, we do some sales at Hillsboro in our Caldwell location where we don't necessarily video the cattle. We'll take some still pictures, show them, and then market uh, some load lots of cattle. Uh, that way, uh, move a lot of direct cattle 
you know, that don't ever walk in our facilities anymore, you know, will go straight to the farm and load them. It's less stress on the livestock, you know, health is better on them because of the stress level being down. And, uh, you know, it's good, it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, the, buy, the sellers don't have transportation costs getting them to our facility. The buyer don't have the added stress on the livestock to uh, have to overcome. Is Angosaurus more important as a feeder or fat cattle? I would say it's hard to put a dollar figure on the value it brings to the feeder cattle, uh, but you can set in any sale barn in the state and see that the, the Angus influence has been very great uh, in the number of black hided cattle that, that come to the market. I'd say it's easier to put a dollar figure on the monetary value on the packer side of it. I hope that answers your question, but uh, you know, I'd say it's an equal value, it's just harder to put a value on the feeder calf end of it. Are there ways to get more consistent price reporting from different producers' yards? Well, um, one thing we struggle with in the state, uh, which we have to compete against, uh, and it's been an argument of mine uh, with ODA, um, is the fact that we have no price reporting from an independent third party at any market uh, in the state of Ohio. Uh, whereas we're competing against the Kentucky feeder cattle market, which has st state subsidized uh, USDA market reporting. Um, so from my position, uh, representing the, the members of our co-op, uh, it's hard to uh, get that consistent reporting that's of much value when it's not coming from an unbiased person. That was a good answer. <laughs> I've practiced. <laughs> I grew up in West Virginia and was shocked when I came to Ohio as far as cattle marketing reports. Yes, I've, I've argued that point for a long time. We need more market reporting. Uh, I had a discussion with uh, Kim Harmon out with uh, USDA in Springfield, Illinois about it last week at NCPA convention and uh, she agrees but the way the budgets are everywhere I don't foresee that being a, a changing thing. In fact she mentioned that Texas lost all their tech all their reporting except for the handful of markets that go to make up the CME uh, feeder cattle market and uh, so it's it's changing and uh, going to be an issue in the future kept the nationwide. And Dawn we have one last question. They want to know for the feet lot requirements, how many square feet per head are allowed? Under the um, GAP pro the GAP program, um, with cattle having uh, that are fed outdoors or have access to continuous pasture, they require 250 square feet per animal, and I'm talking that would be cattle that's running on 20, 30 acres. Uh, for cattle in a uh, in a conventional feeding barn. Uh, there's no square footage requirement. The uh, guidelines or the standards simply say the cattle must have sufficient room to be able to stand up and lay down and move around without disturbing the other animals. And I know that's a, uh, a very gray area, but um, if you're c familiar with slatted floor barns, you know those animals are somewhat um, compact and very tight. Um, so you would not want animals quite that, quite that crowded. But there is not a square footage requirement. Just the standard actually says being able to move around without disturbing the other animals. Do we have another question? Yeah, read it out. Does Pineland have a minimum number of, of fed cattle or feeder cattle required before we would do business? And uh, we do not. Um, I think we've talked about that. You know, is it is it it's certainly uh, much less than 50 head. You know, we Logan here in Southern Ohio, and we have suppliers in Southern Indiana, you know, that only have 25 cows. And I think at some point in time, it becomes inefficient. So we don't have a minimum number, minimum number, but I would think, you know, you need to have somewhere around 10 or 15 cattle to go at one time, uh, just simply from the uh, logistics of being able to move the cattle around here in 
and Hillsborough area and Logan's been very good to work with on the Ohio Signature Beef Program and our general pine land business. Um, as he mentioned earlier, the, a lot of producers only have five cattle at one time. Um, but it, you know, these audits are very expensive. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense to uh, spend nineteen hundred dollars for ten cattle. Um, we are negotiating that down with Earth Claims to where that would be a more reasonable number. And um, because part of our business and part of what we do at Pine Land and, and also what Whole Foods does is to promote the smaller farmer, you know, and uh, you know, um, so that that's something that we encourage. And anything else, Jeff? Yeah. Is there a way to locate GAP certified farm? In our area, is the question is is there a way to locate a certified a GAP certified farm? Yeah, there are producers up in northeast Ohio are interested in doing one. There's several um, in northern Ohio. I can't name the the, the the name of the town, but it's um, it's it's over on the eastern side of the northeast section. There's a way to um, talk to some of those people and. Um, and, and particularly in Northwest Ohio, um, Sean Davies and uh, Bruce Stone and Dan Probos, they're uh, all part of the Ohio Signature Beef Group and, um, you know, uh, would be glad to, uh, to share their thoughts on the GAP program. Right, yeah, Logan's number there is on the screen and, and uh, he can help coordinate some of those things. Or you can call me as well. I, I don't standing right here right this minute. Um, I'm not for sure how many gap rated farms would be in the uh, northeast quadrant of Ohio. I know there's at least one that has about 300 cows, and there's also several feeder calves, feeder calf operators in eastern Ohio. Um, multiple thousands of cows represented there in the uh, uh, up and down along I-77. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, Logan. Thank you, Don.